All right, welcome back, everybody. So last time we were discussing uh, what bifurcations might look like in uh, higher dimensions, right? They do exist, and there's actually a really quick way for us to produce uh, prototype systems by uh, in uh, in a more in a precise way. You say that this is a suspension of <clears throat> of the uh, dimension one cases. Uh, via the standard uh, attractor or via the standard attractive system, right? And that's exactly what this uh, what this deal is back here on the previous page, right? The extension into higher dimensions just says add on an extra equation that attracts everything toward the x-axis. And that is, uh, in, in more rigorous, rigorous terms, that is something called a suspension of the system, of the original uh, one-dimensional system. Right. So, uh, it turns out that now that we're in dimension two, more interesting dynamics can occur. And we've already seen in chapter seven that, or even in, yeah, in chapter seven, we can have, uh, limit cycles, right? In chapters, chapter six, even we talked about, uh, centers. We talked about closed orbits now being possible, right? Talked about, uh, yeah, talked about our, uh, periodic solutions. But now that we are in dimension two, there is another kind of behavior that can, ha that can happen. And it has to do with these limit cycles or these periodic behaviors in general. And to just, just as much as uh, fixed points can undergo bifurcations when they become non-hyperbolic, uh, non limit cycles can do something very similar, right? And we use the Poincaré map to talk about non-hyperbolic fixed points. And uh, in that case, the eigenvalues, uh, at least one of the eigenvalues of the, uh, of the Poincaré map has to live on, on the unit circle in order for that to occur. But I'm getting a little far ahead of myself. Uh, what we can uh, think of in this case is kind of the same way that we started out in section 8.1, where we can talk about how fixed points uh, or how bifurcations can be extended uh, around fixed points into higher dimensions, we can do the same thing with limit cycles. We can go ahead and say that a limit cycle can just appear in a uh, canceling pair just out of nowhere. So a saddle node bifurcation of these limit cycles can occur where there's nothing, and then it turns into a, uh, a single semi-stable limit cycle that kind of branches away and produces this stable and unstable pair of limit cycles. And that's an interesting case. That's something that uh, we would definitely like to consider, something that we need to think about in moving forward. Uh, something else that can happen, right? we could extend the transcritical bifurcation where uh, limit cycles collide, turn into a semi-stable limit cycle, and then split again. That's maybe not the most interesting bifurcation, but it's a bifurcation all the same, since we do have this middle case over here Right, and I didn't put arrows in there, but it does this, and then it goes there. Right, so that would be the progression of the phase portraits. Uh, but we do have this middle case where we have a non-hyperbolic limit cycle. Maybe not the most interesting case, but it's still a bifurcation. And we can also extend the pitchfork. And that pitch pitchfork uh, takes a limit cycle and Sprouts, uh, it spawns a pair of limit cycles surrounding the original one. And that comes at the cost of, st uh, of uh, altering the stability of the original limit cycle. And well, again, this is also a very interesting case because we have effectively changed the uh, qualitative dynamics of the system. And we've created uh, solutions now that, trans uh, that begin periodically have some transient behavior, and then go to a different, or uh, go toward a different periodic solution. So this is something that we do want to consider. This is a kind of a, a transition between uh, periodic solutions that might be, might be useful to us, at the very least, to consider as the mechanism of some sort of physical phenomenon. But all three of these guys, all three of these extensions, because they're not dealing with fixed points, they're not local. Right? These are not local bifurcations anymore. These are now what we call global bifurcations. Right? So we're moving down the list down here. 
These are called global bifurcations because they are dealing with, uh, with sets that are, uh, that are not just a single point that we're zooming in around and checking out these uh, local dynamics. But the change in qualitative behavior occurs away from fixed points, and these bifurcations uh, are, uh, are going to be called global. So what might not be so obvious is that we can actually play with this third case to turn it into a local bifurcation, right? So we can actually pull this guy, right? This, uh, this limit cycle can actually be contracted down to a point, and we can still see this outer limit cycle kind of spawn out of that fixed point, right? It's kind of a degenerate case, but it's all the more interesting because we've gone from fixed point behaviors out to cycling behaviors or periodic behaviors. So this is the fourth case that I want to consider. And this one actually is a local bifurcation as opposed to a global one. Now, this has to occur around a spiral, right? So there has to be a, uh, a complex pair, of, a complex conjugate pair of eigenvalues for the fixed point. And we need to change the local stability of the fixed point in order to make sure that uh, we can invoke the poincare ben dixon theorem. Right, we can actually create a trapping region uh, using this sort of setup. So the limit cycle now is spawned from the, from the original fixed point that was stable. The fixed point changes, to, uh, changes its stability to be unstable. And when it does that, we create a trapping region where, uh, wherein a limit cycle must exist. And in this case, it will be a stable limit cycle. So we can actually find this in the following polar system. Right? You might have seen me uh, using these sorts of examples long before, a long time ago, back in uh, chapter 7, uh, maybe a little bit at the end of chapter 6. But this, can, this sort of behavior isn't just kind of me uh, like supposing that there is a system that does this. No, we can actually find one, and it's actually something that looks a little bit like this, where we're saying that the omega, or sorry, the uh, r dot term has technically three fixed points, but only two of them are going to be visible to us because r needs to be a non-negative number. Uh, and theta dot, right, theta dot is uh, never going to be zero, so that means we're always going to be cycling in the counterclockwise direction. We're always going to be spinning. But the thing to take away here is that this system is kind of the standard one to think about. Right? We can kind of simplify this original starred system uh, with the correct parameters in omega and b. Well, b should b could be zero. So the point is that we're going to use this, uh, this system down here to create uh, the scenario upstairs, oh, yeah, create this scenario upstairs in number four, and this at fa at mu uh, mu c mu uh, so c for critical. The bi the bifurcation then occurs at the critical mu of zero, and this is called a Hopf bifurcation, right? And it's also attributed to uh, Henri Poincaré, and I believe is it Alexander uh, Andronov. I believe it's Alexander. Yeah. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah, let me know in the comments down below. Uh, but the Poincaré Andronov Hopf bifurcation, and because of their close relationship to the pitchfork bifurcation, Hopf bifurcations can be supercritical, subcritical, or semi stable. Uh, or no, sorry, excuse me, no, no. Uh, either supercritical or subcritical. There's actually a case called a degenerate. Uh, bifurcation, but we are not going to talk about that one in, in any any depth, because uh, it does happen, but uh, it's something for later perusal, not, not necessarily on a first pass here. But the point is that we can take a fixed point, a spiral, and alter its stability so that we produce a, uh, so that we produce a limit cycle. Right? And this is the whole point. We take uh, asymptotic behavior, we take this nice fixed point behavior, and we destabilize it so that we get periodic behavior. And this is the whole crux. 
We can either we can turn on or turn off this uh, periodic behavior. Now, hop, the hop bifurcation occurs uh, in that in that case where we switch the stability of the fixed point, and we can actually see that in the following diagram uh, for the uh, for the eigenvalues of that fixed point. Right. This remember uh, bifurcations occur when the real part of an eigenvalue hits zero. In this case, we're going to get it twice over since these uh, complex conjugate uh, num these complex values have to occur in conjugate pairs. So if one of them crosses the imaginary axis where the real part is zero, then the other one has to cross as well. So this is kind of represented in this diagram down below. So we can either go from the left side or the right side, but the point is that we have to cross the imaginary axis in order to switch on or switch off the bifurcation. Right? And when we're on the left side of this diagram, the real part is negative, so we have a stable uh, configuration. On the right-hand side, the real part is positive, so we would have an unstable configuration. And remember, this corresponds to the fixed point, not to the cycle, right? not to the limit cycle because right, I'm dealing with eigenvalues, right? Not the, the, so these are the eigenvalues corresponding to the fixed point, not to the eigenvalues of the limit cycle in the Poincaré map. Just to be very clear there. But we've seen uh, what the polar normal form looks like for this Hopf bifurcation, and I've been using in previous lectures the Cartesian normal form. And you can show how to go from one to the other. I believe we've done it before, where we use a polar transformation Right, we use a, a Cartesian to polar or polar to Cartesian uh, change of coordinates. And we know that this system is actually conjugate to the polar, uh, that this Cartesian uh, normal form is actually conjugate to the polar normal form through that change of coordinates. And we can actually see the, uh, the, the Hopf bifurcation a little bit more cleanly in this polar form, which is why we usually go to it first. But yeah, it's it's a little bit a little bit trickier to, to work with the polar coordinates or to the Cartesian coordinates. Uh, but you might want to consider using them to some extent when you start thinking about the plane as the complex numbers. So x and y would be the real and imaginary uh, portions or the real and imaginary parts of a uh, yeah of a complex dynamical system, depending on time. So that's something for uh, later perusal. Uh, somebody could actually explore that uh, normal form, uh, the Poincaré normal form, for this uh, bifurcation. At some, maybe for their final project. I think that would also be very interesting. Uh, have to have to deal with something called the Lyapunov co coefficient. But you know what? Actually, is that uh, yeah? I think I actually mentioned that in a previous video. But anyway. This particular system would undergo a super critical Hopf bifurcation because of that minus sign right there. If R is very large, that means that this cubic term is dominating and the negative R cubed is going to be a, a, uh, a, an attractive term. Right? This is something called a restorative term. It's going to try to bring everything back toward that R equals zero equilibrium. But if we're close enough to the origin, if R is small enough, then the linear term takes over and uh, the r cubed term goes away. So the linear piece is going to be the dominant term there and that's the piece that we're kind of focusing on turning on and turning off the stability or switching the stability. So anyway, this system is going to undergo a supercritical Hopf bifurcation at mu equals zero because of that minus sign on the r cubed. If we flip it to a plus r cubed, then yeah, if we go far enough away, the cubic, cubic term will dominate and it will be a globally repulsive behavior. So yeah, it'll be a subcritical Hopf bifurcation instead. Okay, so this actually completes our list, right? It concludes our investigation of the co-dimension one bifurcations of smooth systems. There is one other co-dimension one bifurcation, and this actually occurs for uh, higher dimensional systems. Uh, or you could actually see it in the discrete case, the discrete map case. Uh, I think you would have to go to two dimensions to see it, I believe. 
This is something called the Nymark Sacker bifurcation, and uh, I will leave that as a potential project for someone. So I'll, I'll leave that in the list of projects that we could talk about for the end of the semester. But for right now, your list of co-dimension one bifurcations, the most common ones that show up, live in this little red box, right? So we have consolidated everything, right? Everything we know about these co-dimension one bifurcations, specifically in dimension two, this is a complete list. In fact, I, with the exception of, the sole exception of the nymark sacker bifurcation, these are all of the co-dimension one bifurcations. So pro, uh, someone's project could be to discuss how we know this is a complete list for co-dimension one. Or maybe even you can kind of expand on this idea and just say, okay, here's why Nymark Sacker doesn't quite fit this list. Uh, and I'll actually, I keep saying the name, I should write it down. Nymark Sacker. Right, and that is another co-dimension one bifurcation, but we usually think of it in terms of uh, discrete maps rather than the smooth uh, co-dimension one bifurcations. But you can see it to some extent in the, uh, uh, in the smooth case. And this will actually show up, I believe, starting in dimension three. Right, it has to do with, uh, with, with invariant tori that kind of spawn into existence. But the idea is that your project would be to consider, okay, if this is a complete list of co-dimension one bifurcations, Maybe your next question would be, how do, what do we have uh, for classifying co-dimension two bifurcations? What uh, progress has been made in that on that front? Do we have a complete list? What might it look like? What kinds of bifurcations show up? Right, so entirely possible for that to be someone's project. But what we're gonna do now is, uh, now that we have a Hopf bifurcation on this list, I would like to show you what it looks like.